Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Those of you who join, the, who join us on Zoom and those of you who join us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and I'd also like to thank Rula, our guest uh, from Standing Together, who I'll introduce properly in just a moment. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Maya and I am the Deputy Director of Yahad. For those of you who don't know Yahad, we are the movement of British Jews that campaigns for peace in Israel-Palestine. Um, just some housekeeping uh, rules. Um, there's a Q&A box that you can see in the bottom of your screen. Please use it to submit any questions you may have uh, through this webinar. We will try to fit as many uh, questions as possible in one hour. Um, we are also live streaming this on our Facebook page. We'll try to take uh, questions uh, from the comments that people leave there, but uh, again, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so you may have noticed that uh, with us is Rula Daoud from Standing Together. Later, uh, Barak Ravid, um, an Israeli journalist, will join us too. And um, the reason he's kind of a few minutes a few minutes late is because Netanyahu uh, summoned um, a press conference uh, half an hour ago, uh, which was unexpected. So he's covering that and he would um, join us in a, few, in a few minutes and give us all the insight from the latest press conference. Um, but now for Hula. Hula is the co-national director of Standing Together, or in Hebrew, Omdim Beyachad. It's the joint Arab-Jewish progressive grassroots movement of Israel. They mobilize people around issues of peace, of equality, social justice. Um, Rula is also a speech pathologist in her training and former uh, profession. She started her activism in her current city of Lod around issues of women's rights and gun violence and promoting partnerships in mixed cities in Israel. Rula worked as a community organizer at Standing Together for two years where she produced a lot of events and protests with hundreds of activists before she was uh, appointed to be co-national chair. Barak Ravid, who will join us shortly, is the senior diplomatic correspondent for Israel's Walla News website and at Axios. Before, he was the diplomatic correspondent for Israel's Channel 13, and he worked in Haaretz newspaper and also in Ma'ariv. Um, he covers the Prime Minister Office, the Foreign Office, the Defense, U.S.-Israel relations, EU-Israel relations, and the non-existent at the moment peace process. Um, recently, the White House uh, negotiator, Jared Kushner, took pride in the fact that um, his team managed to keep it a secret about uh, the UAE-Israel UAE deal. And he said that uh, even Barak Ravid couldn't uh, break those news. And he said, I think that in Israel there's Barak Ravid and there's the Mossad. So I hope all the information we get from uh, Barak tonight would also be um, interesting in that, in that level. But first, um, we'll start with you, Ula. And again, big thank you for joining us today, this evening. Um, so we, we came here to talk about the growing protests in Israel. It's been more than two months now, I think, that uh, week after week, for some people day after day, um, people are out on the streets uh, protesting. And my first question to you is, who are these protesters mm -hmm. and what do they want? Can we even define what they want? So yeah, so just let me start by saying thank you for having me and for everybody who's like watching us right now. And maybe I can I can start talking about from the you know the whole when the whole Corona COVID nineteen started. So what happened actually in Israel in so many countries is the economic situation really deteriorated. Uh, people became unemployed. We we had much more higher numbers of unemployment inside of Israel, and in the first month we began from. Uh, 1,000 to 10,000 to until we reached a million uh, unemployed uh, person in Israel. And when the unemployment really reached out to people and the businesses were closed and people were, weren't really allowed to go out and work, the government couldn't uh, actually give us uh, any solutions. Uh, they say just you have to stay home, you have to take care of your health, of the public health. Uh, everybody who had uh, small businesses, everybody who was a uh, 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 released from work because the company couldn't pay for his own uh, actually salary, found himself sitting back home and uh, getting paid zero money. Most of the people were get getting paid zero money and people actually 
came to a point when they understand that they needed to take action. They, need, they needed to do something. And Standing Together actually is a grassroots movement that believes in the equality and having a social system that works for everybody. For people who live in the center, in the south, in the periphery, Arabs, Jews, uh, secular or religious people. We see everything that's happening inside of Israel as reflecting and affecting everybody inside of the Israeli society. So the first action we took with so many uh, people and uh, who actually suffered from the economic situation is actually we started protesting. And that really started after, um, after the corona came. We had um, a shutdown, uh, if you call it shutdown in, in English, uh, where people were uh, actually sitting home for a one month, uh, a whole month, 30 days, not working, not uh, getting paid. And when they opened at last and said that COVID-19 has been kind of, uh, uh, we were having less people who are suffering from uh, Corona. So they let actually uh, people go out and go back to work. But the fact was that only 40% uh, of the people uh, got their jobs back. Most of the people are still sitting home. Right now we have 800,000 uh, unemployed people in Israel. So what happened is basically the people were fed up. People were, when it comes to your own uh, salary and to not being able to bring food to your own house and your own kids, something really changes inside of you. So people started uh, going outside, marching and demonstrating and asking for solutions from the government to give the people. The same, at the same, actually, uh, if you all know what's happening in Israel, we have a prime minister who's, who has, um, who's been, uh, um, if you can help me with English, I will be, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. facing three criminal charges of fraud, bribery, and breach of trust. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So people actually started protesting about that issue months before, because Bibi is having, we're having a year that is filled with three elections. And just two weeks ago, we started talking about the fourth election. People were saying actually that we're having so much elections because Bibi or Netanyahu or the right wing doesn't want to leave uh, uh, the power and give the people another, any other solutions. Uh, so people started demonstrating for that before. And what happened is with the economic crisis that we had, and every the issue with the prime minister that we have right now, actually we had two main uh, subjects that people came out and protested against the economic situation and the prime minister they're calling out for the prime minister to actually step down uh, and face uh, the legal charges that, they, that he has. So these two uh, big demonstrations, big issues became very relevant in so many places inside of, uh, uh, inside of Israel. And for now, we've been having, I think, two months of, uh, of just, you know, continuing a uh, continuancy of, of uh, uh, demonstrations. Uh, we have them in Tel Aviv, we have them in Jerusalem and Balfour, we have them on something like 150 bridges uh, on the roads inside of Israel, main roads, actually. Uh, we have them in the very many uh, parts in the periphery that we've been able to uh, connect uh, different people also from the periphery who couldn't come to any other bigger demonstrations and just went out in their own period. So we have demonstrations for two weeks in uh, uh, big Arab cities. We have demonstrations also in small uh, villages in the north. We have in the Negev, the Ersheva. So basically the demonstrations are, are, are happening everywhere. You have in Jerusalem, you have in Tel Aviv, you have in the south, and you also have it in the north. But the, I think the main uh, place that the whole um, media is talking about is Balfour, which is happening actually in, in Jerusalem, and giving more focus for what's happening in Jerusalem and less focused for uh, uh, other demonstrations that are happening all over the country right now. So, and when we look at the people who come to these uh, demonstrations, you can see that they're like, more, also you have activists and you have more younger, younger people who are coming out because they feel that they have no future right now. Their future has been stolen from them. They have no jobs. We are unemployed. We just, uh, many of us had so bigger dreams uh, after finishing uh, uh, college. And uh, whoever lived in Israel or actually visited Israel uh, can see that living in Israel is very expensive. It's not cheap. 
to live in Israel. And once you, and it's, you, and also you have no real uh, public transportation transportation who comes to the periphery so you have less a uh, kind of a uh, job uh, opportunity inside of Israel so you have actually these kind of um, differences between the periphery and the center for people who, who work so and that is why actually most of uh, some of our demonstrations also took took place in the periphery to make these people actually demonstrate for the inequality the uh, uh, the unemployment situation and also calling for uh, uh, the prime minister to actually leave his position and we're trying to make a, a bigger a, a bigger issue we're calling for something that is bigger we're saying that nobody in this government is actually actually cares for what the people and the citizens living here really want right now so if we're talking about a change we're talking about changing everybody if we want a government that works for us this is not the government that we have right now so the call is for something that is bigger. It's not just for Bibi to go uh, and, and leave. Uh, it's also the economic situation, the injustice, the inequality. Everybody who goes to Balfour, which is the most uh, mixed uh, uh, demonstration that is happening right now, you can see uh, uh, many subjects, many things people are fighting for. Some of them fighting, uh, bringing uh, uh, signs against the occupation. Some of them are talking about the economic situation. Some of them are calling for BB to step off. Uh, some of them are, are talking actually about the violence, uh, the police brutality and police violence that we're having. And some of them just this week are more like women right groups who are talking about uh, justice uh, for, you know, uh, um, for women, for a woman who has actually suffered from uh, um, rape just uh, last week. So you have many issues people are fighting for and like bringing up signs for it. And it's becoming this very vivid kind of place where you can demonstrate for everything that is bothering you right now. So you can see many people, many signs, many colors. Uh, and it's kind of, uh, uh, from one place it's refreshing to see so many people going out to demonstrate. But on the other hand, uh, we need to take a, a much smarter and diagnosed strategy of what we want right now. We need to call for something that is common for all of us in order to be able to actually fight for it. So I think these demonstrations are going to keep happening, uh, but we just have to wait and see and see for how long this is going to happen and what's going to actually be uh, the outcome of all of it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. And... Um... Hello to Barak, who has uh, joined us. Hi. Hi. Sorry for the for the delay. I was uh, I had to uh, to watch the Netanyahu press conference as uh, part of my day job, and it just ended up as one more uh, press conference where he just took over the prime time without really saying anything. So now we can uh, now we can go back to the things we planned. <laughs> so no important headlines for us to consider. He's not accepting all the demands of the protesters. Uh, no, 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 not really. Not really. Um, he, just, he just announced that, you know, he's, he's just a political spin uh, about the political crisis he has with, uh, within his government and about the possibility of fourth elections. And it seems like at least it's not going to happen tomorrow, as many people feared. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get around to the fourth, to the unending election cycles in Israel <laughs> in a moment. Um, Barak, my first question for you is, we just heard from Rula about who the, who the protesters are and what do they want, and that sounds very varied, actually, and not that focused, and some people have more of economic concerns, some, people's are, some people are more concerned about democracy and rule of law and, and the prime minister's kind of decency. Um, do you think those protesters have a lot of impact over over Netanyahu, over the government in general, Netanyahu in particular? Are they are they pressuring him in a certain direction? Um, on this question, I have um, good news and I have bad news. Uh, what do you want to hear first? Bad, I guess. <laughs> the bad news. Well, the bad news is that those demonstrations are not, at least for now. They don't really have a, a major political impact on 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 the uh, on the on the map of the next uh, Knesset or on the um, on public opinion. It's not uh, 
it's not really moving. Uh, you don't see in the polls that um, uh, votes are moving from uh, from uh, right to left. Those are the those are the bad news. I'm not saying it might not happen if the demonstrations continue another three months. Okay, but I'm just saying that for now uh, they don't really have any uh, immediate real political uh, impact. Those are the bad news. But there are good news. And the good news uh, are that uh, many of the people you see in those uh, protests, and I'm sure uh, uh, in part of what Rula just, um, just said, and, and it's something that I think is the most important or most interesting thing in, th in those protests, that a lot of the people who come there to, to Balfour Street every, uh, every weekend are people that up until few weeks ago, a few months ago, were not politically involved um, and were not politically affiliated and um, they were, you know, part of this um, uh, generation of people between the ages of 20 to 30 that, uh, and I know that because this is my, uh, this is the audience I'm trying to, to reach as a journalist and I'm not having a really uh, a, a successful time in reaching them because they just don't, it, it just until a few weeks ago, just didn't care. Okay, they, they cared about, you know, they had dreams about their future, they had jobs, uh, they were uh, dealing with uh, the day-to-day -day lives, they didn't care about politics, they didn't care about, um, about who's the prime minister. I'm even guessing that some of them maybe didn't even vote. Uh, and I think that this is the main change that you see in those demonstrations, many people who were either not politically involved or were very, very, um, um, very little involved and that uh, the current situation with the Corona crisis and the economic situation created this cocktail that got them to uh, uh, go out of their houses, go to Jerusalem, uh, and protest about, and it doesn't matter what's the slogan on the sign that each of them raises in the demonstration, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but the fact that those people are going out to the streets and demonstrating, this is a change because it means that each person like that who goes to the demonstration has a lot of friends that, that didn't go or that, still, uh, that are still staying at home. And even if they'll stay at home until the protests stop, it's, again, you know that those people, when they're talking to their friends, three months ago, they were talking about, uh, you know, their jobs and where they went, where they went out at night and about day-to-day -day stuff. Now, I'm sure that each of them, when they speak to their friends, they're talking about politics. And this is something different, and this is something that at least gives the potential of some sort of a political change down the road. Thank you for that. So bad news are, it doesn't have a lot of impact at the moment, but a lot of people that were before quite non-political are being politicized in this moment of, of crisis. Um, and I guess my next, my next question is about people that were all, already very involved in, in, in politics and went to protests uh, way before the corona crisis started. And this one is specific to you, Vula, about, um, about the block, the anti-occupation block in these protests. Uh, recently, the Israeli journalist and photographer Organ Ziv published a piece in uh, Plus 972 magazine where he said that anti-occupation activists are no longer outcast in mainstream protests. And he said that protesters that are holding signs against the Israeli occupation or ones that are demanding justice for uh, Yad al-Khalek, uh, 32 32-year-old Palestinian with autism that was uh, shot dead by Israeli police in East Jerusalem uh, a few months ago in May. Um, Oren says that previously those protesters, that kind of anti-occupation stream was quite marginal and that in these protests, it's no, no longer the case. Do you, do you agree with him? So I, I can agree partially actually, because when we look at what's happening in the demonstration that we're having right now, 
you can see that, as Rubit said, most of these people have never been politically active before. They have never really went out to demonstrate for something. But what happened because of the corona and all the situation actually brought them to the streets to, to actually fight for their own future. But uh, most of the, the, uh, the bloc uh, that fights against the occupation is basically based for the left the left wing that we have in Israel. And when the demonstrations first started, actually the people who started it were actually also from the left and more center uh, part of the political map that we have right here. So the, the anti-occupation is, is the block against the occupation actually went out also with these people and it became, a, the slogans were became very familiar with people. And today when you go to Balfour and you also see the people who are there, there's something very symbolic in Jerusalem when you talk about uh, occupation and the situation of the occupation, because these are also one of the demonstrations that you have a, a, on regular basis in, in Jerusalem. Uh, people going out and actually demonstrating against uh, uh, the occupation. And I think the, the death of Yad Halla uh, uh, actually resonated uh, in a very, uh, in a way that most of the, most Israelis, also Jews, that we have here and also uh, uh, who are living here uh, took it in a very kind of a, uh, also emotional way because uh, Iyad al-Halla was actually um, a, a, a person who had, who suffered from, uh, uh, you know, um, a much uh, a more uh, but in a special needs. It was more of a special needs and it really related to, to other um, conditions that we already had here for the police uh, treating you know special need people in such a brutal in such a brutal way, and he had also uh, two incidents before Iyad al Halla inside of Israel for people also shooting and killing, uh, for I'm sorry for the police shooting and killing uh, uh, people who have special needs. So all of these actually came together and brought some kind of a different definition, uh, also to Iyad al Halla and justice for Iyad al Halla is more of bringing justice to Iyad and his parents. And the demonstrations against uh, the occupation, uh, because of the whole view of it in Jerusalem, it's not the, it's not hard to see them. But today, when you look at the demonstrations that are happening, also you can see the majority of the people there are more of uh, the left and kind of center uh, uh, demonstrators. And these kind of issues are actually dealt with in the left, in the more left uh, uh, wing that we have. Uh, in the Israeli society. So I think that is actually the main reason uh, that it took a different uh, angle right now. And also in Jerusalem, the bloc against the uh, occupation is, is uh, very strong. They come, I think, from the beginning when the demonstrations started at the Balfour streets, they were like the first to come also with their own signs. So it became kind of part also of the uh, every weekend demonstrations that we have uh, these signs. Mm -hmm. Th thanks for that. And if we're already touching on the issue of the uh, conflict of Israel and um, its relationship with the Palestinian people, um, Barak, Yahad supporters have been following very closely uh, Israel's or Netanyahu's uh, annexation plan, or at least annexation talk uh, for the last few months. Um, now it seems that because of the new deal with the UAE, the annexation is off the table, but can you tell us a little bit about this deal and how it was received by, by Israelis and potentially by some of the people that are attending these protests? Uh, first, I just want to add to uh, what uh, Rula said. Um, uh, again, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to sound uh, uh, too uh, pessimistic, but you, you have to understand, uh, and again, especially because our audience here is 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 from the UK, uh, you have to understand at the end of the day, I do agree that we see in those demonstrations uh, some signs about against the occupation and and against uh, and for justice for Yad al Khalak, but it's and, and which is something that we we might uh, or we didn't see before. But it is still you have to understand it's it's the fringes, okay? Uh, and and I don't think you know it's not a it's not you know it's an understatement to say that it's not a majority. But it's again at the end of the day, um, in the Israeli society, 
the number of people who care about the occupation is very, very, very small. And I'm being uh, very, uh, and I'm trying to use my um, British understatement here. Uh, okay, and again, it's, it's just the reality, regardless of if you think that it's good or bad, if you, but that's, this is the reality. Um, the issue of the conflict with the Palestinians is not in the political debate in mainstream Israel. It's just not. Uh, you, you look at the, at the debate within the, within the political system right now, the divide between left and right in this country right now is not about the occupation, it's not about the Palestinians, it's not about the West Bank, it's not about the settlements, it's about rule of law and democracy. Uh, I'm not saying those are not connected, but it's not what, it, what, Israeli, what Israeli politicians and what people involved in politics are fighting about. They're fighting about whether we should have a prime minister with three indictments. Okay, that, that's the divide between left and right today. If you think that it's not okay to have a prime minister with um, three indictments, you are uh, automatically labeled as a liberal, a treacherous lefty. Okay, even if you support annexation of the entire West Bank, but you just want a prime minister who doesn't have three indictments. Okay, so it is as ridiculous as that, the situation in the Israeli political system. So uh, I think that this is, so, so when, we, when we're talking about, again, the occupation and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's really, it's something that I'm telling you, I, I'm telling you about myself, it's something that I'm really interested in, but I don't really have anybody in my immediate surroundings that care about this. Okay, so, so it's, it's just an example. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm mainstream Israel. Um, uh, and about, so about the, uh, the annexation, uh, the annexation plan, God rest her soul. Um, it's, um, it's been buried in, uh, in the cemetery of uh, crazy uh, political initiatives. And, uh, and, we have to, um, to thank uh, the Crown Prince of the UAE, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, for that. Um, and I'll, I'll try to explain why. We need to go back to uh, January, when President Trump uh, uh, released his plan uh, and invited to the ceremony uh, at the White House, the ambassadors of the UAE, Bahrain, and Oman, and all of them showed up. But uh, the ambassador of the UAE, Yusuf El Utaiba, who's very close to the Crown Prince, he might be the, the closest person to the Crown Prince, told Jared Kushner and his people, he told them, listen, I'll be happy to come to the ceremony if it's important for you, but I just you know, want you to reassure me that I'm not coming to a ceremony just in order to be embarrassed that Netanyahu is going to announce annexation. And they told him, don't worry, no annexation. They also told this to Netanyahu who chose not to believe that this is the real position of the White House. And he announced that night, uh, I was there in the briefing at the Blair House right across the street from the White House that he's going to annex the West Bank on Sunday. This obviously, hasn't happened because the next morning the White House told them, we told you you can, so maybe you didn't understand, but we're telling you again, he got very, he was very embarrassed, but that was that. But then there were the elections, the new unity government and the unity and the coalition agreement that said that Netanyahu in the coalition agreement put this deadline of July 1st for uh, moving forward on the annexation plan. Uh, what happened was that the main player in the Arab world to go out against the annexation was the UAE. And this was very interesting because the UAE doesn't care about this issue. It just doesn't care, okay? It, it's, and, and the reason they cared is because they care about other regional issues. They care about their uh, uh, rivalry with Iran. They care about their rivalry with Qatar. They care about their rivalry with Erdogan in Turkey. And they figured that if Netanyahu goes forward with the annexation, it will be used by Erdogan and by uh, the Emir of Qatar and by uh, Khamenei in, in, in Iran as, as, as ammunition in their fight against the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, so because of reasons that have little to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the UAE understood that they need to kill this uh, initiative. And they pressed really hard, both publicly 
and privately, privately with the White House. I told them, listen, if you go forward with this annexation, forget about normalization with the Arab world. And then they did something very interesting. Their ambassador in Washington published an op-ed in the Israeli press in Hebrew, in the Idiot Achonot newspaper, the biggest newspaper in the country, on the front page, an op-ed in Hebrew, which is something that, that was never done. And by this combination of speaking directly to Israelis publicly and speaking privately to their leaders, the UAE created a situation where it started getting very clear to the White House that it might not be such a good idea to move forward with annexation. And the combination between that and the fact that inside the Israeli government, obviously there was no consensus on it. Benny Gantz and Gabi Ashkenazi were firmly uh, against this. This brought us to the end of June when the White House envoy Avi Berkowitz came to Israel and basically told Netanyahu that even if the White House will let him annex something very, very small, very small part of the West Bank, he'll have to give back 10% of the West Bank and move it to Palestinian, uh, to the Palestinian Authority, which is a big no-no for, for Netanyahu. And Netanyahu was very angry about this uh, turn of events. But then the next day, Berkowitz went, met him again in Jerusalem and told him, you know what, here, here is another idea. Maybe we should just put this whole annexation thing, uh, off the, we take it off the table. And in return, the UAE told us that it's ready to uh, move forward with normalization, full normalization of relations with Israel. At the beginning, Netanyahu uh, was very angry that he, he understood that this annexation project is going down the drain. But then at the end of the day, he said, if they're serious, I'm ready to consider it. The, the White House went back to the Emirati officials, asked them, are you serious? They said, yes, we are serious. And then Netanyahu basically took a decision to bury the annexation plan and move forward on the peace deal with the UAE. And the negotiations took between six to seven uh, uh, weeks and ended with this trilateral phone call between Trump, Netanyahu, and Mohammed bin Zayed. And the result was that the annexation is dead. Netanyahu says that it's a, um, a temporary suspension, but again, I don't see this issue coming up again. Obviously, if Trump loses the election, it's completely dead. But even if he wins, I don't see Israel moving forward on annexation, at least, at least until the last year of the Trump presidency. And even then, I find it very hard to believe that, that any Israeli government will move forward with this because it, it would mean that um, the entire deal with the UAE would be unraveled. And you have to understand that unlike the peace with Egypt and Jordan, which until today, unfortunately, is a very cold peace, that all the signs show that with the UAE, it's gonna be something very different. So for the average Israeli that doesn't go to Jordan, doesn't go to Egypt, really doesn't have people to people connections, doesn't really have business connections. So if he has something different, something, a, a warmer piece, then the price of losing it would be much higher. So I don't see, in a way, it gives the UAE and other Arab governments more leverage, more political leverage over the Israeli government, uh, any Israeli government that would want to move forward on, on annexation. Um, but when you ask the average Israeli, I think it's, it's all the opinion polls showed that the vast majority of Israelis uh, prefer peace with the UAE over annexation. I think it was 75% in prefer peace with the UAE, 15% or 17% preferred uh, annexation. It shows you that at the end of the day, this whole annexation plan was pushed by a very small but very vocal group in Israel when the vast majority still thinks that, uh, that peace is quite a hot commodity still. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's reason to be optimistic. Okay, thanks for that. And um, it's interesting to hear that this new relationship with the UAE may be quite different from what Israel Israelis already know from the, the relationship between Israel and Jordan and Egypt and how that could have an impact in the future. Um, Ola, 
Do you think that many of the people that attend these protests, um, the new protesters, if you like, or the, or, um, the veteran protesters, how did this issue of, of the new agreement with the UAE impact them, if at all? I mean, you saw some commentators a bit more cynical saying this was all a ploy to try to kill some of the momentum of the protest by, by forging this peace deal. Um, what, what, what's your take on it? Well, I think you have different voices, but I think that the, 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 the main voice is, is talking about that this is not going to make really any difference, and this is all kind of a plot for um, uh, actually, uh, you know, avoiding saying that we lost when it came to annexation, and uh, right now I brought you peace. Uh, at least from where I, the place I come from, the activists and the people that I'm, I'm more like surrounded, uh, surrounded by in a daily they listed them having peace with a country that there was never, you know, war between Israel and the UAE. So it's not like really real peace because we all know that we Israel already had diplomatic uh, a relationship with the UAE. So I think the issue is is, uh, um, is less kind of a taking uh, any you know headlines uh, or uh, pressing as a as an issue that really can make any difference uh, right now. You have voicing that saying voices that are saying this is just normalization and this is not gonna also solve any uh, problems that we have because the occupation is still here. But mainly, it's not uh, a real uh, big issue. It was for so many people a, a way to make many jokes for the past few days. But uh, I don't think it has any more uh, kind of a, a weight or any more. You know, can't really. It hasn't been an issue, uh, at least from. The, from the, from the place where I stand and the people that I, uh, I demonstrate with. Okay. If I can Thanks. just Thanks. add, uh, if I can just add, obviously the, uh, um, A, I don't think the, the, the peace deal with the UAE was a ploy. There, there are no evidence of such a thing. So I think we should stay away from conspiracy theories and leave them to, uh, um, um, to, um, to, to Netanyahu. Um, and uh, not engage in conspiracy theories ourselves. Um, and the second thing is that, you know, the, the peace deal with the UA is not going to influence, is not gonna uh, convince anybody of the people who are protesting or anybody of the people who lost their jobs or any of the people who think Netanyahu is corrupt, it's not gonna change their minds. It doesn't mean that the, that the peace deal is not very important. It doesn't mean that it's not a huge achievement. It doesn't mean that it's important it will contribute. It will contribute a lot to every uh, to every Israeli for decades to come. But it still it doesn't ma it doesn't change the basic situation. And you see it in all the polls. Right, just half an hour ago, there was a public opinion poll on Channel 13 that showed that that um, the same number of people blame Netanyahu for the situation. So it's not. It didn't change anything. He didn't gain. Uh, any support uh, out of it is is the number his number of the number of seats he gets in public opinion polls just is still going down so it doesn't change and this is by the way this is why I think Netanyahu deserves credit for it because for him politically it would have been much uh, it would get he would score much more much more points politically by staying on course with the annexation even if it's just talking about it okay mm -hmm. and uh, and by uh going for and by you know taking an taking off the table and going for peace with the uae i think he had disappointed some parts of his political base and he knew that he's not going to gain any political points out of it I, I think that this is one of the rare moments in the last 11 years that i'm covering netanyahu 24 7 it's one of the rare moments that he chose the national interest over his personal uh, uh, interests. Okay, that's that's interesting and good good to know and a uh, good memory too uh, from from the eleven years of uh, Netanyahu's uh, rule. Um, Barak, Very you rare. said that he's Very not rare. he's not yeah you said he's not there's not any obvious political gain for him uh, from this situation. And um, is there anyone else that is gaining from this situation? And I'm not just talking about the deal with the UAE. I'm, I'm returning to the protests. 
um, can see on social media some um, politicians from the from the left and from the center uh, attending these protests. But how involved really um, is the Israeli left parties like um, Meretz, for example? Um, um, I'll continue on my uh, uh, pessimistic uh, uh, approach here. Uh, I don't think that, um, at least for now, uh, again, the Israeli left or the Israeli center doesn't gain anything politically out of those protests. N again, not in the immediate term. I think the protests do create, as I said before, do uh, move people to be more politically involved, move people who are center left. And this is, you know, it's a big thing, young people to be politi more politically involved, it's important. But uh, uh, believe it or not, the person who uh, I think um, um, gained the most uh, political points out of the current situation with the corona crisis is Naftali Bennett from, you know, on the right of, of Netanyahu. Uh, and by the way, uh, um, rightly so, because at the very early stage, he understood that the coronavirus crisis and the economic situation are the most important things right now. And he, you know, he even, Bennett even had this amazing statement uh, at the beginning of July when he was asked about the annexation. He said, nobody cares about annexation. It's not important. Don't deal with it right now. Right now is just corona and jobs. This is the only important thing. And I think, you know, uh, this is why many people on the center, not on the left, obviously, but on the center, uh, when, when, when they're asked in the polls, I think they, they say that they're going to vote for him. It doesn't mean that this is what's really going to happen in the end, because he's, you know, at the end of the day, he's, you know, radical right wing uh, uh, and has, you know, uh, um, messianic, uh, homophobic, racist people in his party. So uh, I don't think that on election day, this is what we're going to see unless he's going to again, once again, you know, form, uh, you know, a whole new party. But uh, right now, to, 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 your, to your question, the central left in Israel didn't gain anything politically from those protests. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Rula, so the political left in Israel is not gaining currently any, any, is not scoring any points from these protests at the moment, according to Barak. Are they involved in the organizing at all? I mean, if there are some people that are now just starting their political journey and are being politicized for the first time, are the parties or political figures trying to work alongside organizations like yours, standing together and others in organizing these protests? Um, that's a, a question we had from um, Linda, who is uh, tuning in, and she also asks are, if there are any religious groups um, that are involved in the organizing or in the, in the protest themselves as participants. Yeah, but just let me ask you just Linda, what, what do you mean by actually religious groups? Um, like there's not like really, you know, a, a one group as coming under, you know, the name, any religious name who comes. We have different people coming for these uh, demonstrations. Well, actually, I, I do agree with Barack that these demonstrations are not really helping uh, the left wing that we have right now. And from where I see it, they're not helping because they actually uh, um, focus the media, the media, the, the whole focus that we have on, on the demonstrations, at least that, that happening in Balfour Street, is just saying about asking people to go home. Uh, but and these kind of protests, and these kind of headlines actually serve more the right wing and, uh, and Bibi's himself. And what we're trying to do, what we're trying to make, uh, if it's a, a standing together as a grassroots movement or other movements who come kind of uh, organized, people who organized under many names and different names and who are fighting actually for more than just saying uh, we want Bibi uh, out uh, and we want for Bibi to resign. Uh, other groups are asking actually for a future, a different future, uh, asking for a government that works for us, 
the citizens who live here. So you have different many groups and different names. Um, I can tell you that uh, for me at least, the people I work with and I have and I go out to demonstrate with and I organize and mobilize are just, you know, regular mainstream kind of people. people some people of them don't really have, you know, don't belong to any kind of a party uh, right now. But we do have uh, parties, I think, such as the uh, Merits, uh, the Joint List, who are also um, coming to these uh, demonstrations. And I think we also actually via social, social media. Uh, so we have many parts actually coming and taking, you know, their own uh, place in these uh, demonstrations. But uh, what I think and what I believe that if these demonstrations are just the main focus is gonna still be uh, uh, for uh, asking Bibi to resign and to leave because of his, uh, uh, his actual situation right now. I don't think that these demonstrations are gonna uh, bring us any fruits uh, uh, for the, I don't know, the, the, the end of the year. It's not really helping uh, uh, the demonstrations that are happening because what I think and what we think it should be uh, the main focus is actually asking for an alternative, something else, asking for a government that really works for us. So the focus is on the government itself and not just Bibi as a one person. Um, but unfortunately, again, I can say like the media is also uh, uh, selling and actually more focusing on, on uh, signs and subjects that talk also just about Bibi. Um, and I do hope that this thing is gonna change because what we're trying to build and make uh, inside of standing together is more de demonstrations that have more of a Arab-Jewish uh, uh, partnership and demonstrations that happen more in the periphery, such as Nazareth, Jdai uh, Demakir, Beersheva, uh, different places, not just to be in the center of it, also Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So we, this is what we're working on right now. And uh, we're hoping actually to give uh, uh, people uh, more place uh, as another subject to actually demonstrate and protest for. Um, and this mm -hmm. is what we're working at. Yeah, we're also in Balfour, but we're also in different other places. Mm -hmm. And can just to I say there's just, clarification from... Word? Sorry. Can I just say one word about what you just said? I, I just, you know, what, what standing together are doing is very important. I'm not trying to disregard it in any way. I'm just saying that at the end of the day, and this is something the left in Israel, uh, in the center left in Israel, uh, forgot, that at the end of the day, uh, you change the situation, the reality in the country in elections. And the only thing that matters is if you have more votes than your opponent. Uh, and uh, sometimes I feel that we fell in love with, uh, in a way we fell in love in, 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 in uh, feeling good with ourselves and feeling right and demonstrating and we forgot in the end of the day what matters is on election day. And unfortunately right now in all the polls, you see that the left is shrinking. And even the joint list in all the polls is going down from 15 seats to 14 to 13. In one poll, they were on 12 which means that less people are saying that they'll vote in the elections. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I'm not saying that demonstrations are not important, they're very important, but at the end of the day, what matters is, is, what, if, is how many people go to vote on election day and what they're voting. Everything else uh, is just less important. Okay, speaking of elections, Barak. If, there's, if, if Israel is about to have its fourth election in two years, um, in coming months, what are the chances that Netanyahu would not come on top of those elections and form the next government? Um, very low. Very low? Okay. And why, Some people talk about maybe there would be uh, an effort to, uh, uh, from within the Likud to... No chance. No chance, okay. No chance. <laughs> No chance. He's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. the, the main reason he's not going anywhere is because there's right now uh, on the center left, there's no credible uh, 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 leader that can, uh, that can run against him. Uh, and this is why, um, and, and after what happened with the fact that Benny Gantz uh, took his uh, 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 party uh, uh, apart, and uh, join Netanyahu, what it did was that it's just, uh, it, it killed 
completely the uh, the possibility of a credible uh, alternative, and uh, I just don't see on the horizon anybody who can uh, who can be that uh, credible alternative. It's it's just uh, the reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good to know what we're what what's the um, reality, as you say. Um, we say that there are a lot of people that have been politicized in these protests that never went to protests before, but there's not a single party that's clearly benefiting from this party or a political leader. Um, so I want to go back and talk about the people on the streets and, and, and what's their background, what's the demographic. So I'm, I'm going back to you, Roland, also with a clarification from Linda in her previous question about religious groups. And uh, I think she means um, ultra-Orthodox, Haredim, uh, knitted kippah, etc. Um, people that live religious lives are they active in the protest, either as organizers or or just attending the protests, or not really? Uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't seen any of these groups actually organizing and coming. Uh, but I think this is also, you know, it's actually the same reason why you don't see like you know, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel actually engaging in these demonstrations that we have in Balfour or even in Tel Aviv. It's because there's something that is not, you know, uh, more common for everybody to come and fight for. And I think this is one of the reasons uh, us as a grassroots movement that we believe that if we, if we want to have a, a, a real chance for change or for build, building any alternative in the Israeli society, we need actually to address uh, subjects that are relevant to everybody that we have right now. And this is actually why we chose as a movement to uh, uh, fight more for the economic situation that we have right now and actually asking uh, for a different government that can basically uh, uh, serve uh, the citizens who live here and just like, not just a, a, a small uh, minor uh, um, community inside of Israel. So, uh, and this is what we're actually also trying to do right now. So bring these demonstrations to other parts of the country and to make it more uh, Arab Jewish uh, uh, demonstrations inside of you as well. Um, so I think my answer for you is if you're talking, there are no real, uh, uh, you know, organized groups, at least from what I saw uh, the last uh, few times uh, I went to Balfour, basically. Um. Our time is about to um, uh, be done, so I only have time for maybe one or two more questions. And Barak, we have a question for you from Smadar, uh, who is tuning in, and she asks, why is Benny Gantz not a credible alternative to Netanyahu? Because he ran for three election campaigns on the commitment that he will never sit with Netanyahu in the same government, that he is working to replace him, and that Netanyahu is, is corrupt. And then at the end of the day, he's sitting in to, with him today in the same government. I think it's uh, uh, any Israeli a citizen that has a pulse, uh, I think understands that uh, Benny Gantz is uh, not a credible yeah. alternative anymore. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, and my last question, which is for, for both of you, is how do you see, what do you think the future holds for these protests? Is it, is it going to end in a few weeks? Will it, will it carry on? Will, it have, will we see emerging leaders coming out of these protests as we, the same way we saw in 2011, um, some of the leaders of the protests ending up in the Knesset? One of them is today a minister, um, Itzik Shmuli. Are there any figures like that that you think would be influential in Israel's future um, and change Israeli society? I don't know if Ula, maybe you want to go first. Well, I don't like to be, uh, 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 I don't like to bring the, the room down, but from what, I, what we see right now and what's happening and also talking again that the demonstrations haven't really made any, you know, main changes for the left, uh, uh, the left in Israel, I think that if, if it continues this way, if, if we're still going to be more interested of where the, our demonstrations are going to be and which parts are going to, you know, um, uh, talk to the newspaper and to the journalist, we're not going to make any change. But on the same side, we do believe and we do understand that 
making change in the Israeli society is going to take some time. It's not going to happen, for my, in my opinion, uh, at the end of these demonstrations. This is not going to be the change. I see what's happening right now as kind of the start, because you have, as Barak said, you have more people who haven't been political before becoming more political right now for everything that is happening. And I think the, 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 the thing that we face right now is how do we make these people more political and how do we bring these people to kind of uh, uh, to the kind of politics that we really want for a country or for, um, a, for a place and for a government that really serves us all. And this kind of change is gonna take us much more time. Maybe we're witnessing actually the beginning of it all. Um, for the demonstrations themselves, I really can't tell you what's gonna happen in two months because I think we sat down two weeks ago and we said these two weeks are going to be the last two weeks we're going to be in Balfour but again yesterday I think we had 10,000 people again demonstrating so it's kind of uh, changing all the time. Yeah I, I, I want to add like exactly what Ula just said. I thought uh, that uh, those demonstrations we would start seeing those demonstrations uh, weighing down um, already. Uh, I'm not saying that I thought that there will be no demonstrations, but I thought that, you know, the numbers of people will start going down. And actually, they're still, I think, very slowly, but they're still going up. Okay, again, it's not dramatic, but every time you see that it's at least the same number of people, but I think it's, in a way, also we see that it's a bit uh, uh, going up. So uh, I think that the question will be... Um, what will happen uh, if we'll see the corona crisis uh, continuing, uh, if we'll go again for a lockdown, uh, um, if the, not an if, it's, it's obvious that the economic situation is going to get uh, worse in the coming weeks and, and months. And the question is if there will be enough energy. I have to tell you that if we'll see uh, the same uh, kind of people in those demonstrations, if this will be the, uh, the people that are coming, then I'm not saying it would, uh, it would, it would end, but it would be very hard for it to, to really go somewhere. Uh, the main question for me is if more and more uh, parts of the society will, will join. And until now, uh, it's not the case. Uh, I'm not saying it as, as, as criticism of people who are demonstrating, I'm just trying to reflect um, the reality. I, for example, I thought that, um, uh, that uh, much more people who are, um, who were affected by the economic crisis would come. Um, at the beginning, there were parts of the demonstrations were uh, small business owners, and right now it seems that those people in a way uh, are not part of the protest anymore. Um, and at the end of the day, we're still with more or less the, um, the same crowd that we saw all along those, those demonstrations in the last few weeks and you don't see more parts of society joining in. Okay, thanks for that uh, sober, analysis. Um, our time has just um, run up, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you both again, Barak and Rula. Um, maybe not the most um, optimistic uh, prediction for, for the next few months, but uh, there's definitely uh, something to look forward to in terms of years from now in the long term, what will happen with these people that are just now being politicized and what will happen with the political opportunity of, of uh, um, a continuing economic crisis and the corona crisis. So we'll, we'll keep following uh, up close. I'd like to thank also everyone who tuned in on Zoom, on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, please follow us on, on social media to find out more about our future events and um, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.